Cheers and hello. We are going to go to the asylum today. Yes, the, the asylum. What the asylum was, was it was an SS Asylum Springs, Siloam Springs, in the Ozarks, of course. It was just another swamp shithole. So the asylum was this place that was designed to be an entrapment system, um, trafficking hub. And uh, what they had, how they set up this village was they had these, these fences that were pretty tall, dead ends, these gates, these railings that would go down from mansion houses that surrounded this, this Masonic village. And uh, so sometimes the trails that came down from the mansion, if the kids were good, they would go on the trail. If they weren't, they would have to go down these weird railing system and they'd push kids down the hill. So it's like they were spiritual shackles. Um, the stuff they put them through with all these little railings on these precipices and stuff. So it was a stronghold. And uh, there's mansion houses set up everywhere. And they were creepy stone mansions overlooking um, the downtown. But they were more like hotel trafficking centers, I guess you call them, because there was even kids in the hotels downtown. And one of these houses on the hill looked like a, a Hansel and Gretel type house, and it overlooked downtown. And another one of these houses was by the water downtown, and it had uh, a dungeon in the basement. So what they did was they would line up kids, and they'd have them in like um, metal cages, and they would put them up against the stone walls which were in the basement and have them touch their hands onto the stone walls so that the house would reverberate that energy from being electrocuted so i rebelled in that mansion and i didn't put my hands on the stone walls because i didn't want to give them that um, and they've been doing this for decades to kids because uh even if you go into the 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 Dairy Queen, the DQ down there now, it's got these like really old fashioned pictures of these really crazy looking kids. And they're, it's like they're acting and um, trying to smile, but they're like definitely something wrong with them. They all look insane in all these old fashioned pictures and they're like posing to get ice cream. And uh, some of the kids are like looking just like they're crazy. So there's definitely something that went on in that town for, um, many, many decades and uh, wasn't good. So this Hansel and Gretel type mansion had this stone table in the backyard. And, uh, and if you didn't do what they wanted, they would put you on the porch and then send you to the stone table. And they were doing like rituals with the kids there and had an umbilical cords there. And uh, they always had these like giant chimneys outside and would burn things on there or take them down the railings on the hill at night. And one time I remember a reptilian person was uh, burning out the tree stumps. They had cut out these tree stumps for some reason, and they're just charred and hollow on the inside, but just burnt and black. And they would put things in there um, to burn and do rituals. So it was really weird. It's like, it's not like these trees were electrocuted with uh, lightning. They were, um, ritually hollowed out and burned out. So um, the kids would go down this railing from the Hansel and Gretel house and uh, they would throw some of these kids down the hill and some of the kids didn't make it. So they actually were buried on that hill and because um, some died from it. And, um, and then what they would do is they'd walk the kids down the railings and then take them underneath the dam and then they dunk their heads under the water uh, to get them to act right and because uh, some of them weren't complying and then they told us that there was alligators in the water so this water system that just goes like around the city a little bit in this loop and uh, so it was really hot of course in the Ozarks so we'd want to go in the water, but we'd have to like mentally challenge ourselves to say like, there's no alligators, there's no alligators um, to go in the water. And because some of the little kids couldn't swim either. So they were really afraid to jump in the water to get away from 
the entrapment system because people could just come and like grab the kids anywhere downtown because there wasn't many people there and everybody kind of that was involved knew exactly what was going on and how to like corral them in. So they got us to be afraid of the water and afraid of all their constructs, of course. Um, so then um, across the street from the springs and the dam was a Masonic temple and they were doing rituals with kids there. And um, they were doing um, sexual things to the kids right on the altar in front of everybody in the room for all to see. And I remember one day, two of the kids tried to run to this creek that was down from it. And, uh, and so they were killed in front of me and my brother. And we just kind of stopped like a deer in headlights and turned back. So then across from there was like this huge shed that had these vehicles. And then there's this like lizard man mechanic that was there. So we had to also deal with, with him. So they cornered a lot of kids into places and buildings and, and narrow areas. And, uh, they had these sewer drains coming out and what they would do to scare kids is they would like open up these, um, sealed lids, I guess. And so the kids would have to like be confronted with, Oh, do I want to get thrown down in the sewer? Or do I just want to continue to go where they want me to go? So sometimes they would put a kid down there and then they would cover it or else there was this other little stone area at the bottom of uh, one of these mansions. And then they would actually put a child in there and then put a stone over it to trap the kid in there. So there's actually bones um, in this place. And what they did is they put like this Masonic marker right next to that area on the ground by a sewer and just to brag about what they do because they're sick. So there was like little markings all over the place, actually, and like an upside down pentagram, or they'd be like a tombstone here. I mean, we're, we're walking over um, high ranking Freemasons graves in this park. It's very strange. And then there was this like little bridges around the area too, short little bridges. So we would see cars coming, um, kind of like encircling this little area, like the black cars or black limos would come. And then we just see like the tops of the black cars and kids would just randomly disappear because of these cars. And you could kind of tell like who was in the cars or what was going to happen. They just get taken. Um, so yeah, they would trap kids in certain areas and uh, that Hansel, there's another house actually that they had this like two trails um, the kids were walking down and then there's a street and then cars would come and pick up a child or a child that they had rolled down the hill and then be like a grab bag, uh, on a stick. And the person would get out of the car and take the bag. I don't know if it had money in it or whatever, but it was like a pickup point or transfer point or something. So kids would just get randomly taken cause they didn't want to be put in the ground. Um, And then I had, uh, I had this protector there too, this guy, um, that I loved very much and I looked up to him and I adored him and we were really powerful together and, and he was pretty amazing actually. So, cause what he could do is he could take your like worst fears, your bad experiences, and then he could help you transform them into something, um, beautiful and override it and uh, kind of wash that uh, sickness away that we were experiencing. So we were actively practicing manifestation together and we were trying to manifest rainbows and we did. Uh, so I called him a prison wiz wizard one day and we were transforming our reality um, together. So we were trying to beat the system beat the game and and we did so we we'd sit there in the park we made these plans uh future plans 
and um, we could always make each other smile, which was very helpful um, because it was always a trepidation and sense of uncertainty. And um, so I was sitting on a green bench and one day things got really weird. Um, the guy that I was sitting next to with, he went into altar and he started talking strange. Like he was this um, African-American female slave that had to go make money or something. Um, so then I knew something bad was going to happen because we were both kind of glitching out there for a second. And uh, so I went and I prayed and went up to the bench again. And there's this light that came out from behind my back and uh, a tall angel manifested and he saw it. And those moments were very helpful because, because they gave us a lot of hope. And um, then he was taken in this black car and then I'm left on this bench and started panicking at first. Um, but then I calmed down and then these like sick MIB looking satanic weird people started walking down this, the stone bridge that goes by this three tiered fountain down there. And they're walking a dog and, uh, they brought me into this limo and they had a genetic mutation there that they had, uh, tortured the guy I'll just call Jay with and they use his DNA and, and they put this thing what I, that I call a humanzy chimpanzee human on a chain with a collar around its neck and it even had a diaper on it like there's no limits to um, how sick these people are what they have gotten away with um, so I would be stuck sitting on a chair uh, in this vehicle with this thing and and then I saw that uh, there was torture in his eyes and it wasn't really a soul, soul creation. And um, at first it was, it was hard because, you know, you're little and you don't really know how to deal with some of the stuff they throw at you right away. But, um, but then I realized that they're such liars. And um, at first they tried to trick me and say like, oh, it's him. You don't want to hurt him, do you? His soul is in there. But then I realized that his soul wasn't in there and they were just trying to get this creation to hurt me and turn on me. Um, so I didn't consent to that. And prior to this, I'd had that angel experience. So then um, we were very powerful, like a lion of Judah, if the spirit rushed into us, like a walk-in experience. And um, I was just sitting there and I was looking at this... Um, creation this abomination on the chain and in a split second I just got this like rushing power took the chain and the collar and I choked it out and put it out of its misery and uh because it was the right thing to do and then it died and uh um get out I get out of the car and then these sorcerers follow me they there's three of them one woman two males and they chased me under the bridge that they had taken um jay from and drove away with and uh so then they picked me up by my neck um i was little so all i could do is just like shield myself and my spinal cord because their faces all would come to your face and they would try to scream at you and take over your spinal cord and um and get into your mind so so that was really um, an intense uh, battle there. So the Lord protected my spine, luckily, but one of the guys was really strong and he managed to, in this weird supernatural fight, uh, break my legs somehow. And then he threw me down on the rocks and uh, then they knew that it was like all that they could get away with. So then their personalities like, shifted and changed and then he picked me up and then they acted like they were carrying humans or something and then they brought me a block down where there's this like uh, ambulance and then they said that I had fallen and hit the rocks or something and then got taken and drugs my legs uh 
I don't know what braced. And then they put me in a wheelchair. So then after that, they put me up on the top level of a mansion that overlooks a side road. So then I'm up there having to sit in this wheelchair and then watch them throwing children off of this, this high balcony down this green side slope trail. And then at night they would do that in this ringleader that was like a reptilian possessed male that was the head of the Masonic temple would like look up in the sky and he'd communicate with this UFO that was in the air and make these crazy noises before he would throw a child off the balcony. So um, that was a hard frozen spot to be in, in that paralysis and moment of weakness and vulnerability. Um, so then the car would pick up the kids and, uh, and then I was sitting in the wheelchair and I remember that, um, Dave Morrow was there and I got to whisper in his ear, like, it's okay. God sent me the animals to heal my legs. So I had like two cats and like a dog that were, that were helping me, um, heal my legs. Um, it, cause the silence we had to endure was, uh, dreadful. And he just like shook his head like, okay. And then we had to be quiet again and uh, go along with the programming. And um, after that, I was put in some blue, weird barn looking house. And that's when the, the Lord fully healed my legs. And the sky was like blocking me in the kitchen, telling me I couldn't have breakfast unless I um, did something for him. And so my legs got fully healed in that moment and then I stood up and I grabbed a knife and backed him in the corner and walked off fully healed out of that house for good praise God so then after that um, there was some the Freemasons had this time travel tech and there was a, a battle with certain factions to get it and they put me and Jay and some other kids through these uh, time loop scenarios until another faction finally came in and took the tech and had us go on missions and turn the tables and hunt them instead. Um, I mean, we were still like prisoners, but at least it was a little better then. Um, so because these Masons were like soul stalking soul hunters, and it was this time period called like the time wars, the time sentinels, the counts in time, I called them. And there's a lot of ultra weirdness going on then. So I'd be with Jay. We would um, be commissioned to go to the same spots. And we'd sit in front of this bench um, drinking pop. And it's like you could smell sulfur when some of them were walking towards you too. And, uh, and we'd look at the postcards from the time period and they were so funny because they didn't match up with what we knew the place to be in the future. It was like land of a thousand smiles and, um, didn't reflect what we knew that place to be right. Cause it was like a, an infestation of reptilians. So we would spot these reptilian, um, possessed humans from like a mile away. So Arkansas was just full of them and it was a problem. So we'd go to this one place in Sulphur Springs called uh, Butler Falls. And it looked like, uh, it was like this little waterfall dam that was short. And um, um, Jay would just like, we'd be standing on top of the dam and uh, he would like squat down and and just say, look, a butler falls, <laughs> and then fall into the water. <laughs> and then I would do the same thing, like to see who could fall the best or something. So then I do that. And then sometimes he'd catch me in the water and then we could cool off. And uh, I was so little the first time that happened. I didn't even know what a butler was. I'm like, I'm like, what's a butler? But uh, <laughs> I know it sounds stupid, but in the projects, in these weird supernatural situations you have to have laughter or a sense of humor to stay sane 
Otherwise, you're just going to lose it. And you have to captivate those moments so that you can like a timestamp and pick them back up later to like have a refreshing and the decompression uh, and unrepression of it all. So um, those moments were, uh, were very good and laughter and joy and happiness was the only thing that gets you through that stuff. Um, so we were also on the roof of the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs. Um, there was Aryan programming there and um, we could, we'd go and we'd like empty out buildings sometimes. Like we emptied out this red motel building once and because um, we knew that they had kids in there and stuff. And sometimes we could just kind of go rogue and go uh, do our own thing and take care of business when we put our minds together. And then we were on Highway 71 and we'd go to Shadow Lake and it was always this, this corner, but the corner would always change. And um, we were in the 1800s. We'd see it then that we'd see it in many situations in the 1900s, uh, different time periods. And we'd always start at the same point, which is King's, King's Highway in this house with glass on the second floor and this cliffhanger rock. So we also got separated in 1966 in Noel, Missouri. And um, it was like a lot of army people in a parking lot. So I didn't spot them right away. The people that came and took him away from me in the parking lot, because there's like three people that came and picked him up that I thought were part of the um, picture, but they weren't, they were intruders into our scenario. And then I went to a building that I was supposed to meet him at and then he didn't um, show up. So. That's really all I can say about all that because there's only so much you can. It was around Christmas time. Um, so what I learned, I guess, in time travel is that love conquers all. And there are certain things that you just really um, can't erase. Like you can erase memories, but... Um, they're there somewhere and you can always go back and pick up the pieces no matter how fragmented anything's become. And the Lord's translated me through time and in and out of many time situations where I thought I was just stuck in this rubber band, um, like nether zone. And even though it was scary at first, I learned through the experience to totally rely on him and to tether myself to him because he would get me, out of the situations. Sometimes just completely take me out of it if it was too dangerous. Um, Cause I'd like be walking down dirt roads and uh, and like praying and uh, talking to the Lord in my head. And he was always there and still is uh, because he exists outside of time and space. So he's not subjected to the things that we are here in the tangible physicality of the flesh. And um, and he's always there for us in the times when, um, mainly in times that we didn't know what to do, what our outcome was going to be, um, what the answer was, um, we'd have to rely on a higher source because we couldn't see the, the solution and um, from our field vision and our multi-finite potentially infinite designs that the that was co-measured already by his hands because he uh, designed us to co-measure us into certain things and um, soul capacities and uh, and complexities and these forms to to fit into and expand upon before he even um, formed the thought of us and our existence in even in his mind because he holds it all and um still does and the tech is is limited and um there's 25 really good scriptures about time too that you can look up and uh and as much as what we're put through um it's like an egg like all the crackings of a shell of an egg the um the glory light can come in and seal all those cracks and uh, 
seal it and fill it, all those, all those fissures. When you seek the face of like, yeah, you're really seeking to find the face of wholeness and you find yourself in the process of doing that. And Psalms 144 says like man's a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Job 8 says that our days are on earth are a shadow too. Psalms 102, my days are like a lengthened shadow and I wither away like grass. So sometimes our souls felt like they were caught between our shadow or our spirits maybe were caught between our shadow and our souls in these time lengthened walks that we had and experiences. Ecclesiastes 8 says, uh, lengthen your days like a shadow and you'll live differently because then you'll have pure intent to, to fear you. And it'll change you. And there's an appointed time for everything. And, um, and then there's a the time for every purpose, every season under heaven, of course, but it's uh, according to his divine right timing. And as he chooses to see fit and, um, and when we can go home. It's still according to his riches and glory, though, because heaven and earth will pass away, but his word still remains because it's still being completed. The story is still being written and the author. He has to be the author and finisher of our faith and fate and like time strings and quantum uh, loops and leaps and bounds are just uh, the creator's visible thought patterns manifesting down into the 3D. And uh, what I learned through the time travel program too is like mainly the bond of love can't be broken. And, and even if uh, memory's lost, love is not. And I should thank anyone um, that has helped me through certain situations and uh, helped me drain the uh, Phoenix Force and other things, helped in overriding certain situational programming and... Uh, and just being there to remind you to be brought back to your real self. Like, I see you. I know who you are. Uh, just be yourself. Because um, a lot of times we, you know, we were brought to different countries a lot. And so, like, we think, oh, I'm British or I'm this or that. And then you'd have to come back to your real, your real self. So all the king's horses, all the king and queen's horses, and all the king and queen's men have finally put Humpty Dumpty back together again and stay, stay true and real and humbly filled. Abba Yahuwah, I thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you're continuing to do, have done for forgiving us, for giving us a new hope and a new future as we turn to you and your goodness and press in for those blessings you want to pour out onto those that love you. I ask for restoration, reparations, renewals, rectifications, recompense, and a ceiling and wholeness to come into every fractal piece of brokenness and to, to fill us with your peace in all of those areas. And let us sit in tranquility as we stand in awe today and know that you are God. Steadfast, sure, all-encompassing, guiding, a guiding light, secure, fully surrendered to the authority of Jesus Christ, bearing that countenance of our brother, Savior, and friend forever. Thank you for holding us all together in the palm of your hand as you know how we fit there and how we fit with each other and how we're etched out in the palm of your hands to begin with. Let us see the writing on the wall now, the finger of majesty transcribing and transforming us into a greater likeness of your image, emulating higher truths and attributes and characteristics that flow from the mercy seat. Thank you for spearing us from the rod and allowing us redemption, fine tune us into your path and heavenly submissions of balanced reason and harmonic planes and platitudes. Let us walk in the old path, understanding and uh, with a new understanding and uh, knowing how to scatter, take the spiritual weapons and scatter the mouth of the, the sea of Egypt into seven pieces 
when the enemy tries to come against us, when the vices of this world are heavy, casting off the spirit of heaviness and oppression and the struggles with the flesh that rise up against you. Bring us back into correction and into the presence of the one way back to you. Bring, let us be in the presence of the one way back into uh, our kingdom, heavenly kingdom, and that oneness that's the seed in the seed of atonement. Worthy is the lamb who sits upon the throne. Let us be fed from that right hand and planted by living water in those streams. Let those streams be the wellspring that flows from within our bellies. Let us see and be reminded daily of the provision, abundance, and sustenance that comes from you. Let our cups run over when we see the joy that's set before us as the master did. Let us see that there is an end and a resolution to all things. Let happiness be the result of the fruits we grow now. An unending supply of happiness is our storehouse. Teach us how to love one another, edify, uplift one another, and what the formulations of the rest of the universal contingencies are based on and hang upon. And thin the veil in the process. New understanding, new eyes, new ears. Remove any divided mind from our midst, for a divided mind is enmity against you. Refine us to walk in the spirit, see and hear in the spirit, speak in the spirit, with no guile in our hearts. Wash our minds clean and any residual programming. Give us a pure new heart. Anoint our clay lips to speak your clarity and truth. Give us clean hands and a clear conscience and a visionary field again to see all the advantages and spiritual gifts overflowing unhindered. Let us see past any unpleasant scenery or mental scapes with a new anointing and vantage point so that we are better equipped and able to overcome what's next. In the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, amen.